So I want to show you all something. We're talking about pricing. We're going to do some more practicing tonight and then on Wednesday as well. This, this podcast, it, look at the title, Pricing Insurance Risk. They're specifically talking about catastrophes. Uh, these two guys, Steve and John, have a book out that I might buy. They say it's written for actuaries, so it might be over my head. Uh, it's a long, it's a two and a half hour podcast. Oh, man, it was very, very interesting. If you're an actuary, if you can handle the two and a half hours, it's it's pretty advanced stuff. But um, it gives you a real sense of just how complex this business is. This is a very, very difficult business. Um, and the, the question he's asking, if you look back at some of our problems, where's our pricing? All right, let's see where's our pricing. If you look at the problem, he's asking, how do you handle this pricing if you're insuring homeowners with a huge catastrophe risk? And there's a couple of things he debated in there. One of them was, do you change the capital? So there's something he called, which is really, really interesting, which is a big deal when I was at USA, and that's called capital allocation. He talks about some papers that were presented back oh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, capital allocation. So what does that mean? Remember what capital is in insurance? It's net worth. It's not debt and equity. It's just net worth. And so when you think about it, you hold capital to offset risk. So homeowners, you have to hold a lot of net worth. Auto, not as much. So what he's saying is, okay, let's take USA. Let's say USA has $20 billion in net worth. $20 billion in net worth, and you might say, well, uh, $15 billion is for home owners, and $5 billion is for auto. That's what capital allocation is. And this, this podcast completely disagrees with this approach. But that was the tradition back then. Say so. If we looked at this pricing that we did here, let's say we say, you know what, we're doing we're doing auto. Auto, we don't need to write the three to one. We can write the five to one. So let's write five to one. And it's not that very risky business. We can get away with a seven percent return. But if you do that. Instead of charging seven seventy nine, what happens to your pricing? No, it doesn't go down much, but it does go. It makes it. I don't know why it's not lower. It seems like it'd be a lot lower than that. Um, but what they're saying is, do you actually allocate the capital that way? So if you're looking at homeowners, let's see if this works any better. Homeowners, you need to write one to one because it's just so risky and you better have a 12% return. And I'm not understanding. I should have done this in advance to make sure it would work because it should have changed a lot more than that. But Yeah, I'm going, it's going the wrong direction. But anyway, I'd have to work on it a little more. I should have said it. But since that's what he's saying, um, in this, they're, the two of them are asking, and they're saying, don't allocate capital, allocate spread. What he said is riskier product products have to make more income. So essentially what he said is, the firm, well, first of all, they said capital is a shared resource. Everybody's using the $20 billion in capital. Not just the homeowners using $15 billion. Everybody's using the entire $20 billion. But risky product 
And so let's say the firm needs to make uh, $2 billion. A 10% return on that 20 billion. What they're saying is you say, okay, homeowners, you need to make if you need to make 1.5 billion because you're risky. Auto, you need to make five billion, five hundred million. So that was their argument. I kind of want to read their book because they don't explain it well. And the funny thing was the guy interviewing them was like, doesn't capital, doesn't it make sense? Um, if you have time to read, there's a lot of what Kirby's going to talk about. If we can still get him in a couple of weeks, if his schedule's still open, he's going to talk a lot about these type of things. It's a really, really interesting podcast. Very technical. You can see the things they talk about. Um, a deep and thorough understanding of all the relevant literatures that have been Part of a lucid collaborative team of academics and actuaries working out the details of coherent. Coherent is maybe questionable, but maybe to actuaries it was actionable theoretical foundation for pricing insurance. Now that they're both retired, they've delivered us the tome the actual profession needs. They wrote this book. I don't know if this book actually exists in a viable way. Let's see. Let's see how many pages do you think it is and how many formulas, how many pages do you go before you find a formula? There they are. Is that they? Yeah. Looks like a textbook, doesn't it? How much does it cost? Is it priced as a textbook? I don't see a price. Do you see it where you see it? Oh, here. That's not bad. Seventy. Yeah, it doesn't look like a textbook. It's under a hundred bucks. Um, I don't know if we can look inside. Um, how many pages is it? That might be some indication. I don't know how far down you have to go. Five. Wow, five hundred sixty pages. My word. I'm tempted to get it. Seventy six bucks. It might be worth it. I doubt it's on Audible, and I don't think it's a book you could read on Audible. It'd probably be too much. Um, but what's interesting is, um, and this is something we might talk to Kirby about. They're talking pre two big events that changed the radically changed pricing for homeowners. Am I guess what those two events were? Two thousand eight, not oh eight, oh eight. Um, when was Katrina? It wasn't Katrina, though. Oh, wait, I can't remember. It was a major event. If we're talking about a major catastrophe, that might help you. So, Hurricane Andrew and Northridge. They said before Hurricane Andrew and Northridge, every product just had a 5% profit go. 5%. That means a combined ratio of 95% and 5% profit. Auto, homeowners, everybody just had 5%. And then Andrew came along and completely shocked. I think he said State Farms, one of State Farms, Florida companies, and Andrew, they lost everything they had earned in the firm's existence. <laughs> Wiped out every single earning they had for years. Uh, Northridge was true for other other firms where uh, Northridge not, uh, was greater than the premiums for earthquake insurance for the entire history of the industry. So that one event didn't eat up all their profits, ate up all their premiums. So they're saying these two things changed the world. So it'd be interesting with Kirby, as he worked at USA before Andrew and Northridge to see if those two events radically changed his job as well, because those two events had a big impact on USAA. Um, I think the key with Andrew is, and I think we talked about this, when Andrew hit, people were like, wow, that's a one in 500 year event. And then as they look more closely at it, discovered it's really only one in 40 year event, but it was massive. Uh, what else did this do? So it changed pricing. 
Oops, sorry, I'm not screaming at you. I created a catastrophe too as a result of that. Yeah, cat bonds. And what else do you need for cat bonds? Yep, models. He mentioned the lady who started AIR uh, Air. Um, oh, I forget her name, Kathy something. But that when she started, no one was buying the product, and then Andrew hit, and suddenly they had a massive, a, people, a massive group using the product. Uh, she was that Andrew saved that company, and then RMS came along. Um, so really, the history was interesting, um, and. Some of the discussion, I mean, I, I was listening to the podcast while on my bike, so it's not not ideal. No fine sensors could choose a sophisticated portfolio model that wasn't hiding biases or inefficiencies. Now, one of the things, remember on the first exam, we talked about CAPM and what CAPM implies, and they talk about that, and they do ask the question, this really interesting question. If cat risk is a zero beta, why do insurers need such high returns? So they argue catastrophe risk is a zero beta, which means it's unsystematic, it's a diversified, which implies if you're beta zero, then homeowners only needs a risk-free rate return, doesn't need any risk premium. And yet the market demands homeowners insurers provide really high returns. So they talk about that. They say there's something else going on with these insurers. So essentially they're saying CAPM does not apply well to the insurance industry. It's a very different type of industry. So I, if, well, two and a half hours is a lot to invest, but uh, if you do want to listen to podcasts that really hits some of the topics we talk about in this class, it's really interesting. And we'd also really prepare you for Kirby's discussion. Um, the science of managing a portfolio, by portfolio, they're saying if you have auto and homeowners, how do you allocate capital if they offset each other? You can't say we got 15 billion for this, 5 billion for that, but then if the offset, you know, it gets really complicated. And that was part of the issue we had when we were talking about allocating capital. Um, I don't know who that is. Um, he's been on the show five times, so it was interesting. Um, boy, I don't know what that is. I have to check some of these things out. Um, wow, there's some really good links here. Um, yeah, this guy kept asking about the customer. Does the insurance industry customer understand how much value this industry adds to them? Um, they talk about reinsurance in here. They do talk about cat bonds quite a bit, but not in a way to probably help your paper much. Um, the timing of hurricane relative early cat bonds. Uh, they say some guys started cat bonds at travelers. I mean, not cat bonds, the cat models in the 60s. Um, he talked about how some CEOs are expanding in the homeowners because they think they're getting paid for it and others are getting out of the business entirely. And they're like, what are they disagreeing about? Um, he talks about 50% margins for these cat uh, type of products, which would be pretty hefty. We're, you know, we're talking about a combined ratio of, of 50%. Um, yeah, so that was his thing. Don't allocate capital, allocate margin. Now, one thing I thought was really interesting to me, and I'd be interested where you actually end up. When I started at USA, Capital allocation, risk allocation, all that kind of stuff. The life insurance actuaries have been doing that for years. They were so far advanced. And I don't know if these, these two guys have ever talked to the life insurance side. But the things they're talking about is like, it's so hard, we can't get the equation. The life guys were, were doing that decades before. It's really interesting. Probably because it's a little easier risk to do that kind of thing with. Um, that to talk about reinsurance. Why would you buy reinsurance? Um, yeah, yeah, they, topics that we were talking, they talk about the regulatory environment. What if regulators don't let you price what you need to price? What do you do then? Um, 
they talk about the importance of leverage because some of these products are very heavily leveraged. I didn't get, I, this is where I got, I stopped the envelope theorem. So I got, a, I still got the last 20 something minutes to go. Um, so I don't know this last little part, but really, really interesting stuff. Um, so I'll, if I get their book and if it's readable, I'll let y'all know. Let y know. <laughs> I'm fearing that I'm not going to be able to get past the first two pages. Um, it's published by Wiley's, so they must be thinking it can it can be used as a textbook in some classes. I bet none of your actuary classes have books like this, right? Do y'all have specific insurance coursework? Um, so he mentioned some actuaries I know, like, um, oh, there's Steve Darcy and then uh, Dave Cummins. We're, we're going to actually read an article by David Cummins here later. But anyway, really, really interesting stuff. All right, so what I want to do is tonight work another problem, and then Wednesday we'll work one in class. So tonight we're going to do it together, and Wednesday you're going to do it yourself so you can practice with the exam. It's my spacing and quizzing idea. So Wednesday you may not be perfect. I think I'm struggling through writing the wrong answer down and validate up to your memory. We'll do the one that has the five with the zero zero. So there's two of them front and back. Oh. Yeah, I made enough for everybody in class and about 10% of the class is here. So. Uh, <laughs> All right. So let's think through it. Anybody want to give me a guess on what step one was without looking at your notes? We have to get the next year's claims and writing and underwriting expenses. Exactly. So step one is forecast the claims, LAE, and expenses. You're going to take the current year times one plus frequency times one plus severity. Unless it's expenses, then it's just one. All right. What was the second step? Uh, so you present have values. next year's number. Yeah. Is it the investment part? The what? I, was, I said the investment part, but I don't know. If well, okay. What did, what did Warren Buffett call it? Flow. Float. Yes, yeah. All right. So now we got to figure out what the float is. So you want to figure out the present. So you forecast it first, and you take the present value. All right. So step three, I think, is what you're thinking about. Once you have the present value of this and the future value, what what's the difference in those two? Your what you're going to need to get from the investment. Or it is your investment income. Okay. Well, okay. right, because what are you dividing this by? You're dividing this by the investment return. Yes. So that time delay, the difference in those two is, is going to be your investment income. I mean, I, I put down a writing gain in there. That's just, you have to take your premium minus those. Um, okay, I put some extra steps. I can't remember which one I had in these. All right, so step three, get your underwriting gain. And step four, get your required capital. The required capital could go at a different stage, but I'll put it there. But step five is the investment income. I guess you do need the required capital because in investment income, we're going to add in an investment return on that beginning, that beginning capital. So that's why we did step four next. Right. So you got your unwriting gain, you've got your investment income, you know how much capital you need. So now you're going to essentially figure out if you if you made your requirement or not. So the net income is just your underwriting gain plus your investment income. That's pretty straightforward. We're going to do a USA thing. You don't do this with every firm, but we're going to take net income and however much capital increase, we're going to subtract that out because we're saying that's a bad thing. Than your ROE, so it's you know it, it seems complex and it involved, but it's it's not too bad. All right, try it again. Step one. 
Not looking. Forecast. <laughs> Forecast your claims, expenses. LLE. Step two. Float. Float your present value. Step three. The investment. Well, step five is investment. I had two before that one. Underwriting gain. Get your underwriting gain, just oh, subtract yeah. it out. And then what do you need to get investment income? You need to know your required capitals to so get all those required capitals. Get your investment income. And then the last two steps, the last two steps is just adding it all together. All right. So let's try this with this problem, the one that they're both ABC, so I was too lazy to come up with company names. <laughs> I'd probably name a company after that Iowa basketball player. I could remember her name. What is it, Caitlin? Or Caitlin it? Carter. Carter, yeah, the Carter. Smart. The Caitlin Insurance Company. Yes. Um, I didn't care about the men's side this year. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I want to see if she wins. But, so <laughs> I mean, it's amazing how one player can change the uh, viewership of a game. All right. So we've got last year's numbers. So we're going to do this year's numbers. So that's last year's premium. So we don't, that's what we're trying to figure out. Look how I have it in the problem. I give you all the assumptions, and then you're choosing between these two premiums, all right? So this question students ask me, what if I pick one student, one premium, I get the right ROE, do I have to try the other one? And if you're pretty close, it's probably right. You probably could stop there. I'm not actually grading on that. I'm grading on the steps, and a lot of students don't get it right with either premium, but they get 90% of it right. So the key is to know the steps. So we said step one was to do the forecast. So we're going to take 650 times 1 plus the uh, severity times 1 plus the growth and frequency. Same thing on this one. And here we're just going to multiply 1 plus the inflation. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm off one row. Sorry, yeah. don't don't look at that. All right, so... Growth in claims is 3% and 2%. I say frequent severity. I mean, it doesn't matter which order, but um, so times 0.03, times 0 0.02 for LAE. So we've used these two numbers. And then for LAE, it's two and a half and two percent. And growth on earnings and the running expenses is two point two five percent. And you will use all these numbers. There's no like red herrings in any of this. So if you want to highlight them as you use them, that way you make sure if you didn't use a number, you got to go back and figure out where to put the number. All right. Let me quickly do this in Excel. So. 470 times 1.03 times 1.02, 60 times 1.025 times 1.02, and 115 times 1.025. 
And y'all should check me on your calculators to make sure. And you can, you can just stick with two decimal places. You don't have to go out massive numbers of decimal places. Hopefully that's what they'll go. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is that right? All right, so I've done you a big favor here. You notice that the N is 0 0.75, 0 0.75, 0 0.75. So that's going to give you a big advantage if you remember. So the next thing we want to do is we want to discount these, but since they all have the same time, we can add them and then do that. So let's take the sum. Uh -huh. Did you want to put one plus severity instead of one times severity? Oh, one plus, yeah, sorry, that's just typos. Thanks. I'm just seeing if y'all are paying attention. Um, all right, so the sum that, 493.78 plus 62.73 plus 117.59 is 674.10, if I did that right. So I'll, I'll do that on exam, make the end the same. That way you don't have to do the uh, float calculation three times. You can just do it once. So 674.10. Present value is going to equal what? 674.10. Y'all remember this part? Like, plus the investment return is 3.5%. And what? The time. So for. Right, raise it? Yeah, raise, yeah, raise it. it. So that will be. Um, so it's 0.75 for all of them. So that. Okay. That's made it, I made it simple for you. That's why we can do it just once. We don't have to do each individual piece. In reality, that's probably not true. Expenses typically are a little bit more bunched at the beginning and the end. Um, so check this with your calculator. Make sure you're, you're getting that with your calculator. I get 656.93, does that sound right? All right, so I understand why I didn't do the individual pieces. We can only do that because they're all 0.75. If one of them is 0.5, we'd have to do that one separately, but I made them all the exact same thing. So these add up to 674.10. That's going to affect our underwriting gain or loss, but in present value terms, it's 656, which means we're going to make investment income of about 18 
off of this. All right, what do we say step three was? And writing game and the running game. It's gonna equal our premium. Let's start with uh let's let's start with a smaller premium, 672.16. So it's the premium one minus 674.10. Make sure here you're subtracting the undiscounted total, not the discounted total. We're going to have an underwriting loss. Looks like a dollar 94, but. Can't do that in my head though. Bar ninety four. I guess I can. Anybody agree with that or disagree with that? Yes. Sound good. All right. And what do we set, say? Next step was. Yeah, the capital requirement. And essentially here we want we want three numbers. The beginning our current year and next year. It's gonna equal the current year is gonna be six fifty divided by three. And the next year is going to be 672.16 divided by three. All right, that's going to give us the required capital for the two years. So I get whatever those are. Again, just round it to do decimal places everywhere. All right, agree with those numbers. Okay. And then you also need the average part of capital. It's just going to be 216.67 plus 224.05 by like two. And we need the change required. So you're going to need all three of those, 224.05 minus 216.67. So you need, eventually you're going to need all of them. You might as well write them down now since you have them in your calculator. Uh, only one more. 2036. Oops. Increase is 738. Y'all double check me on those. <laughs> I'm guessing the other premium is probably the right one because it's rare that you have an underwriting loss with these with the three and a half percent investment income. It's gonna be a tough to make on any return at all with low income, investment income and a negative underwriting, but we'll see. <clears throat> all right, next step. Are y'all agree with these numbers? Mm -hmm. yep. All right, so next step is what? Why do we need that beginning required capital? 
How do we calculate flow? Remember, we need to calculate what comes after underwriting gain. Investment That's income, it. right? So investment income is going to be the float piece, which is real straightforward. You take the undiscounted amount minus the discounted amount, and then we're going to add in the current year net worth times three and a half percent return. Right. So the undiscounted minus the discounted, that's how much you're making on the float. It's not your float, but it's how much you're earning on the float. That float, remember, is that timing difference. And then we have 216,000 or whatever million dollars set aside for this product. So we get the earnings off of that. So we've, we've done the required capital. Y'all see why I'm dividing by three on required capital. And they they mentioned in that podcast the uh, premiums, the surplus ratio, the three to one. <laughs> it was interesting. I mean, so much of what we talk about in this class is in their investment income. So let's figure out investment income. So let's see my numbers, but there it is. Okay. So the difference I get is 17.17 and then 216.67 times three and a half percent. See if y'all get this same number. So 17.17 plus 7.58. Does that look right or not? Uh -oh. So seventeen seventeen, right? Yes. So is it the seven fifty eight? So it's two sixteen. So twenty four seventy five. Right. The last three steps is just you got all your numbers, so it's just a matter of putting them in. So net income is going to be your underwriting gain plus investment income and equal the underwriting gain was we lost one ninety four. Investment income is twenty four seventy five. Investment income is twenty two eighty one. And we're going to adjust the net income to equal net income minus the change in hard capital. So that's going to equal twenty eight point eight one twenty two sorry twenty two point eight one. Minus our change in required capital was this seven thirty eight. Um, I get fifteen forty three. Anybody getting 1543? Yeah. yeah. Good. All right. And then the last thing is pretty simple is the ROE. That's going to be adjusted net income over average hard capital. So here it's going to be 1543 divided by our average required capital was 220.36. Actually, that's not that far off, is it? It may not be. 
I mean, that could almost be the right answer because I think the other premium would be 42 high plus 15.43 divided by 220.36. So 7%. What did they need to make? 7%. So I bet that's the right answer. Uh, wow, I was surprised even with the right even if, Well, I, I, I set the ROE target so low as well. So, yeah, if, if the first premium works, you can probably just stop there and say that's the right premium. So you don't have to go all, all the way through. So you got a 50 50 shot by one or the other. All right, so it seems tedious, but if you're if you can somehow step back, it's got float in there, it's got underwriting gains, it's got uh, return on equity, it's got the investment income on the float. I mean, there's a lot of things in there. Uh, in this case, what they'd actually file is a 650 going to 672. So I'm not asking that, but um, 672.16 divided by 650 minus one. They'd be asking for a 3.4% rate increase. So you can get a lot of partial credit. I don't think it's that difficult a problem if you practice it. But again, the issue is the exam's in about a month. And so you're going to forget all of this. Uh, but we'll practice it one more time on Wednesday. But I'll make you all do it. Who, who's going to do it right on Wednesday without notes? Okay. All right. All right. We'll see. All right, questions on that? Try not to, don't work ahead on this one yet. I'd rather you practice it in the class, but all right. So um, a quick question. When you were doing the present value, because all of them had the same amount of time, you're saying that we would have to do it if, if it was different. We have to do it three times, right? Well, so I usually make claims in LA the same. Expenses is usually one that is different. It is different. So you could add these two together and discount them and then do expenses separately. If the N is the same, you can add those and do it because you're dividing by the exact same thing. Okay. So you, you get the same answer. I mean, you can always do all three if you wanted to, but you get the same answer as if you do some them together. I'll try to remember to make it the same because there's no reason to do all those extra calculations. That saves you a few minutes. All right, and we used every number in here, so you know there's no reason. So you see how I have the premiums to surplus ratio? I, I'll just say one third of premiums. He was talking about um, Massachusetts, which is really, really quite fascinating. Um, Massachusetts, this was a crisis they created about 20 years ago. They said, since we're requiring you to have auto insurance, we're going to heavily regulate the premiums. So we're going to tell insurance companies what they can what they can charge. Um, and because of that, insurance companies just started leaving the state. And then the state says, well, we got this problem. We've got these monopolies. We don't have enough competition. <laughs> it's like, well, that kind of makes sense. You don't competition because you wouldn't let people pay. So he, he talked about how what an interesting equation that was. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we'll talk about when markets just freeze up because regulators um, try too hard to help. All right. All right. Let's let's finish up a few more of the pricing notes. And I do want to get the Schedule P. So price insurance. You need a cost of equity that usually comes from CFO. They talk quite a bit about this. Exactly what we did in exam one question. They said, well, theoretically, you should look at each product line and ask how much systematic risk it has. And we talked about that, right? Department uh, directors and officers versus homeowners. But he's, they said in practice, the firm just has one KE for the entire firm and uses for all products. So, okay. Life insurance doesn't do that. The life insurance side does have different returns. Your required net worth, that's going to come on, come, and they said it's the rate agencies. And 
they started off, isn't the regulators that require you to hold capital? And they said, which is written because we're going to talk about this, that actually the regulators are far more focused on affordability than they are on capital. They much rather your insurance be cheap, even if you even if you go out of business. The rating sees they don't want you to go under with their credit rating. If they give you a single A, so they said the ratings these are much more drivers of how much net worth you need than than the uh, the regulators. Expenses that comes from CFO, but here you got to be careful. This is a huge allocation issue. So you say, well, how much expenses are homeowners? Well, some of it is directly homeowners, but a lot of it is homeowners and I mean, think about it. So pricing actuaries for auto, you can assign all their salary to auto, but the chief actuary, where does their time go? Some of it's auto, some homeowners, then you have the CFO, you know, so allocation. I remember in the life insurance industry company, I started on the, on the expense allocation side. And, um, one of our products came over and said, we're losing money, we're losing money. So Cindy that I was working with said, well, I'll just, I'll allocate more to the life product because they never complain. And so suddenly they were making money and the life side didn't notice. How did she do that? She just changed one of her surveys or what, you know. So this is a huge, huge issue uh, for any product, any business is how do you allocate expenses to different products? It's not that simple to do. Uh, obviously the actuaries are gonna give you the frequency and severity. Guess how many times they said frequency and severity on this podcast? I mean, it's pretty common. Um, the investment return that comes from the investment department, our CFO, uh, I say float. I should say return on float. So forgive me on for that. The investment, don't, don't mix up. Investment income is not float. Float is, it's those reserves that you haven't paid out yet and you're making investment income on them. So investment income is the return on the float. Um, so premium needs to meet all of those requirements. Uh, in finance, we're doing it this way where we're backing into the number. Actuaries, it's just way, I can't, I can't handle the math to be able to show you all to do that. Um, so it works. What I do gives the same answer. The, the big difference is going to be that subtracting for the change in net worth. That's that's a very USAA kind of thing. But yeah, so what you do, you go to the state and you you file a rate increase. But if you need 12, you probably only ask for 5% because you know that's not going to be approved. Uh, they said in the podcast, he was going back to his actuarial pricing days that some of these are 850-page uh, documents that they send to the regulators. Um, and it was kind of comical, you know, all these pages and pages of numbers. I doubt the regulators read all those pages, but they have to justify their rate increase. Um, so we talked about that in a previous class. Underwriting gain, where we talked through that. Surplus, have we used the word surplus before? Surplus is the same thing as net worth. But that's what the regulators consider surplus to be. They don't consider it belonging to the stockholders. They're like, it's extra money for the policyholders, just in case something goes wrong. Oh, I have a typo here. That's not net work. That's not worth. <laughs> so we're using a premium surplus ratio. We'll go back and talk about the risk-based capital. They did mention risk-based capital as well, but but also said it, it's really the, the rate agencies that drive that more than anybody else. Um, I remember Moody's, they said USA wanted to be AAA rated, and Moody's said, well, there's a one in a million chance that a AAA company goes insolvent. So that means USA, you need to be looking at one in a million year catastrophes, and our CEO just nearly, uh, well, he started losing his, had to take him out of the room and cool him down. He was so upset because we were doing one in 500 year events. The podcast kept mentioning one in 100 year events, uh, but the premium surplus is has been out there for quite some time, but three to one doesn't make sense for every product. You're gonna use a much lower ratio for homeowners, a much higher one for auto, and it, it ignores the business mix. Uh, the term riding business, I don't know if we've used that term before. I don't think Oh, uh, does the life insurance, I think the life insurance uses the word writing business, but um, 
it's just selling insurance. Why do they say writing? I don't know. I don't know the origin of that, but they say they write, they write the business. Uh, there's two types of premiums. We'll talk about this when we get into the uh, the accounting. There's written premiums, and then there's earned premiums. So written business, written premium, essentially what it means is the second you write the policy, that entire premium, you're counting that as a written premium. Earning Earned premium is, hey, you wrote it in November, so you only get two months out of the 12 months in this year and the other 10 the next year. But written premium says the second you write the product, that entire premium is written. So we'll get into that and why they do that. We know eternal equity. We use average net worth. How many averages can you do? We're doing a, a two point average. What could you do? But USA, we did. A 13 point average. How do you do that? You're beginning the summer number all 12 months. You do a 13 point average. Why do we do that? Because our CFO of our life insurance company discovered with a two point average, if he paid his dividend right on December 31st, it really brought down that year, that year in number, really reduced his average and gave him much higher ROE. He got to earn income on that money the whole year. And they, so they went to a 13 point average, shut him down. Um, now, what can you do with a public company? You can only do a five-point average because you only have quarterly numbers, but that's what the ROE is. So do be careful of that. When you pick up ROEs, like off a of Bloomberg or somewhere, return equities usually are on some average number. And so Bloomberg might be using a five-point average. Who knows? You just have to be careful on that. Um, we're going to talk about this. What is that return for stockholders? We said CAPM says this. But the regulators say, well, is, is this on book value or market value basis? And does that matter? Let's see if it matters. It's, it's mattering less today than it has in the past. But let's do what's a good PNC company. Let's try Chubb. I have no idea. It may not matter. Well, let's start with NVIDIA. And videos price the book is 45. So what that means is if their net income is um, 2.5, their gap net worth is 10, their ROE is, two, is 25%. That sounds really good. But their market value is 40 times higher. Their ROE market value does it make a difference? Your price to book is 45. It makes a huge difference. But do insurance companies trade at a 45 to one price to book? Do you think? So what is Nvidia saying? You're a stockholder, you're going to pay 46 times more for the stock than what the accountants say the firm is worth. What do you think Chubb is? Anybody think it's 45? Much lower? So historically, banks and insurance companies have traded at a two to one, but 2008 radically changed that. But let's see how low it's gotten down. So 176, but that's still material, isn't it? 1.76. There's a big difference between a 25% ROE and a 14%. So what do regulators want? Regulators want to do this. So you're making plenty of money. You made 25%. The stock market says, well, no, we, we, this is what our market value is. We need a return on our investment. Our investment is 17 million. It's not 10 million. And so that's, that's part of the debate. It makes a big difference. Banks are, um, a bizarre animal. You look at Citigroup, what's their price to book? 0.52. You can buy Citibank, Citibank for half of what the accountants think it's worth. And I thought gap accounting was supposed to be conservative, but it doesn't look all that conservative. Um, and then one of my favorites, Genworth, another insurance company. 
Uh, they've come up. They've come up. They they were down at ten. They've so you should have bought them a few weeks ago. That would have been worked pretty well. Uh, don't buy them today though. So we'll get we'll get into this. Regulators uh, have a big debate on how you actually calculate the return on equity. So you say, hey, we need an eight percent return. That's what our stockholders require. How you how you actually calculate the return? The regulators have quite a bit of say in that. All right, we already did severity frequency. Um, we already did that. Already done all of that. We talked about actuating years versus accounting years last class. But you remember the difference? Get it real fast in a class. They talk a little bit about this in the podcast. So accident year, another way of saying this, the year the policy was what? What word did I just use? Oh, written. Written, right. You want to look at all the numbers. So if you change your reserves in a future year, you still say, hey, but that's for that product I wrote in 2021, all right? The fiscal is, it's just how it hits the accounting as reserves develop that word Warren Buffett didn't like. So the actuaries are trying to figure out, we think we're gonna spend a billion, oh really it's a billion 20. That 20 difference is going to go into a future year, but the, the actuary says, no, it's this product we wrote in this year. It belongs to that year. So that's that's how we're going to um, use Schedule P. All right, so let's talk about Schedule P here. Let me find one. Um, when you get to the accounting, we might use Allstate for the accounting. If you go to Allstate, the very, very bottom, look for Allstate Corporation. Go to investors and you want statutory. And 2023 is probably not available. What is it today? It's April. Yeah, it's not available. It's not available yet. So let's do 2022. Yeah. Not seeing it here. Insurance investment management quarter. Where is it? Maybe 2021 will be there. Right. I don't know why it wasn't there, but. Let's try this one. Now, one thing you have to, that's interesting between property and casualty, we talked about this in the accounting. They take all their property and casualty companies and they combine them into a consolidated group. So they may have 50 financial statements and then they have one they combine them all. The life insurance industry, when I was there, they didn't combine life insurance companies. They only kept them separate. So this is a combined company. Um, here is just one of the companies. So let's, let's do one of the companies just so we can see. And look at how many pages this thing is. So I'm going to put one of these out there on um, Canvas. Don't click on it and hit the print button unless you got a lot of ink, because it's it's several hundred pages. And I'll show you why it's so many hundred pages. I can't remember if we did this in the life insurance class. We might have run out of time. We did some of it real fast, right at the very end. So here's Allstate. Your financials, 756 pages. I'm going to make a guess to go out to page 150. So I'm only up to Schedule F. What does Schedule F do? It's a reinsurance schedule. Look at all this detail that you provide, you get provided. So I'm looking for Schedule P, so let's try page 250. I'm to Schedule P, but I'm right in the middle of it. How many Schedule P's are there? There's a lot of them. So let's try 215, still in Schedule P. Auto physical, remember I said on auto physical, you don't have as many years. 
because it doesn't take 20 years to figure that out. Let's try 200. Ah, accident health. What is this doing in here? Well, accident health used to be part of property and casualty and got moved to life insurance, but some firms still have some of this left over. Schedule H, here we go, Schedule P. So we got our Schedule P. The first page is kind of like an income statement, but for many, many, many years. Notice that doesn't say premiums written, it's premiums earned. You have your lost payments, your um, adjusting expenses, your legal fees. So we'll talk about salvage and supplication. You won't see that on the life insurance side. Why is that? You might know what this is. You total your car. Who does your car belong to now? The insurance company. What are they going to do with it? They're probably going to sell it to, uh, you all know this firm? It's a really, really interesting firm. I bet, I bet most of you have never heard of them. Copart? Anybody heard of Copart? What does Copart do? It's like a uh, a junkyard for cars. They help insurance companies get value of whatever property they get. It's a really fascinating firm. Very dominant in the industry. Very profitable firm. Um, has been doing well here recently. Uh, very, very profitable firm. Um, but that's what the subrogation is. Uh, Salvage and supplication is, and here's our losses. More detail, more detail. We're not going to use those schedules. We're going to use this schedule here. Schedule two, part two. This is the incurred losses. Remember what incurred means. Um, so for 2012, in 2012, they thought that year's losses were going to total 14,773,570. The next year for the products they wrote, they made an adjustment. They increased it by whatever that is, 70 million. The next year they reduced it by 100 million, reduced it again. This is all the same product, but all of these adjustments are going through these accounting years. All right. So this is the accident year on this column. This is the accounting impact over here. It's a great schedule. These are the incurred. So report it in year end. So the reserves are gonna be based on that. This schedule is the paid. So you should get 14 billion minus 9 billion should be the reserve you set up for 2012. Y'all see that? They think ultimately you're going to spend fourteen billion seven seventy, but they've only spent ninety six, so they got to set up the difference. It would be impossible for the numbers in this schedule to be greater than the numbers in this schedule because you can't you can't pay out more than the incurred. The incurred is ultimate what you ultimately expect to pay out in total. So how much reserve they have left? 14,599 or 14,600. So they got about 60, 65, 66 million they still need to set up for that particular product. And let's look over here. This is I asked on the exam. It's a really easy question. There's that term Warren Buffett doesn't like development. What they're saying here is how bad were you one year out and how bad were you two years out? And again, one of the actuaries, I keep asking an actuary to come back and explain this to me. Maybe maybe we can ask Kirby. Maybe he knows. I don't know. We should have asked uh, McFarrell. I don't know if he knows. I do not understand this first line. I really, really don't. Um, but let's look at another line. So let's look at the 2020 business. So the one-year development is really, really simple. You just take this year minus that year. 19,696 minus 19,551, that's 144. It's a positive number, which means they had to increase the reserves. What impact did that have on this year's accounting net income? 
if they known what they knew this year, they would accept this at 19696. But a year later, they got new information, increases 144 million. What happened to their net income in 2021? It was 144 lower than it should have been if they'd known this year before. So positive number means they're not very good at, for, at, uh, at forecasting. Why do you think the two-year development is? Pretty simple. That year minus that year, real, real simple. And here it's a negative number. What does that mean? It materially over, over um, estimated. They thought it was gonna be 18,666, instead it was 18,235. So here's where the actuaries really get upset. The accountants are going, wow, we had a great year. We made like an extra $340 million and act actuaries say, no, no, no. We had a great year back here. We just messed up and reserved too much. So really this, that 400 million belongs in this accounting. But uh, because we didn't figure that out, we put it in. That's, that's pretty strange. Don't you wish you could talk to the actuaries Wait, what 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 was that? Why don't you suddenly add 400 million and then two years later you said, whoops, we don't really need to do that? I don't know. That's what actuaries have to tell you. Kirby is not a reserving actuary, but he probably knows them pretty well. If I ever run into Mary again, I'll ask her to come talk to the class as well. She was USA's uh oh, she was the best reserving. I mean, she had that thing down. Um, so generally, how well did they do ignoring the first year? Uh looks like they're not too good. They're they're understating. That one four hundred is pretty massive. <laughs> uh, so two years back, but if you added all these up, here six hundred. That's pretty bad, right? They understated their net income this year by six hundred million, or overstated it and understated this year by six hundred million dollars. So one question I ask you is to calculate the one and two year. The, loss development, real simple to do. And another question I'm gonna ask you is, how would you set up a reserve? So what reserve would you set up for this product right here? So they they think ultimately, that's a pretty big jump, isn't it? What year was that? 20, I don't remember what catastrophes we had in 2021, but there must've been something. That's a, see that jump, pretty huge jump. So something happened there. So what, how would you get the reserve for this year? 23 billion, 418, but they've only paid out 14 billion. So what would you say? 23, four minus 14, two, about um, what 9.2 million billion that you'd set up for the reserve there. They haven't paid out much, but you'd have to sum all of these and sum all of these, and that difference should be your, your reserve. And can y'all see why I don't understand the prior 8.5 billion and it's only 6.7? I don't understand that number. I've never had to prepare a Schedule P, the actuaries prepare it, and I've I was never in accounting on the PNC side, just on the life insurance side. There was nothing at all like this on the life insurance side. That they have nothing that even close to something like this, all right? Pretty exciting schedule. So um, I took a week off of work at USA because um, an investment firm in California wanted a uh, stochastic model for a PNC company. And I said, I can't do that, but I can build you a forecast that you can stochasticize, if that's a word. Um, and so I had to actually build the schedule piece for them. And I had to build part two and part three so when they ran scenarios, they need to know that. How much is the reserve? Because that's going to affect the investment income. You know, I, I had to, so I built it starting at this level. And then they're going to run scenarios where they say, wow, let's have a big cat hit here. And then my assumption was, well, if you have a big cat, you're going to pay it out much more slowly because it's going to just take more time. You know, so I had to build that all that in. Um, they paid me a lot of money for one week to do it. And then they came and looked at the model. And the guy that they had hired was a life actuary. He looked at it and they decided not to do the business. <laughs> they were going to try to build this model to get more PNC business. And after I showed it to them, they're like, okay, we can't handle this. So they just, but they paid me money to find out they shouldn't try it. 
what, what happened, you know, life actuaries, they're pretty smart, but this is a very different world to them. And he was like, oh my word. Yeah. There's nothing like this on the life side. So he just, he just gave up. He probably could have figured it out, but it, I think what he felt like if I'm going to go to a PNC company with PNC actuaries where they're going to eat me alive. And he's like, no, I'm not, you know, go hire a PNC actuary. Don't, don't do that. All right. So there's schedule P now schedule P this is at the company level. So schedule P goes down. I forget what this last one is. Um, yeah, that's just some special stuff. Goes down to the homeowner's part. They have part 1A. And they have private passenger. Now, why is this a bunch of years? Because this is price private passenger liability side. The price of private passenger physical damage only has two years. But liability has all of them because it takes a long time to write them out. They have commercial liability, uh, auto liability, workers' comp, which you can see I'll say doesn't do much of. That's 12 years. Commercial multi peril Medical professional, they don't, well, that's interesting, right? $8,000 of that, why, why ever they did that. Medical, they don't do that. I remember at USA, we... Um, we had actually a little sticky that said none that we put on there. I'm sure now it's all computer generated, but back then we had to put a little sticky on there. It said none. Um, Ocean Marine, they do they do some commercial at Allstate, not a lot. Other liability, you can see there, There's we talked about this, occurrence versus claims made. They have those separated out. Um, they do some inland marine, auto physical damage. You can just see just two years. And then you get through all of that. That's part 1A. Boy, there's just, you can see why this thing is so many pages. And then you get to 2A. Well, what is 2A? 2A is what we just saw for the company, but this is only for homeowners. And what's interesting here is we saw that huge two year development. Remember that 400 and something? Most of that's coming from homeowners. So there must have been something. In 2018, wasn't that the year? I don't want to go all the way back. Wasn't that the year they had the big 400? It was 2018. So it must have been, it must have been uh, homeowners. Was 2018, Harvey? You all remember? Anybody? 17. Am I on 17? I'm on 18. Yeah, I don't know. That's, I can't remember what happened back then. You do see a big jump from here to here uh, in two years and another big jump, another big jump. So, and then they're going to have a part 2B, which is going to be the paid on that. So that's why this thing just runs on pages, 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 pages. All right, I'll stop it there. We'll work some problems like this as well. But um, all right, any questions on anything? All right, you want to try it? <laughs> All right, let's let's try it. So what'd y'all get for the the first one? The forecast? 12137. All right. What'd you get for the second step? 11873. All right. What was your underwriting gains then? Uh, negative 1.17. Okay. And then what was your beginning capital? 40. Your ending capital? 40.07. And the change, I mean, the average? 40.35. Okay, I did all four, but okay. And the change? Uh, the 0.07. Okay. So, and what was your investment income? 4.47. Okay. Your investment income, I mean, your um, underwriting, oh, that's the part I left out. So your, um, I knew I had to step out. Yeah. Just a second. Mm -hmm. And so what was your, uh, your adjusted net income? The adjusted net income was 3.2. 3.2, okay, and then your ROE? 0.08. Yeah, right at 8%. I got 
seven nine probably does a rounding. All right, so that looks like the right answer, right? So we started with the right one. Anybody else get that far? Who else got that far? Laura, Orion, anybody else? Gwen, did y'all get that? Step five. You got what? Step five. Step five. So you got the 444? Yeah. All right, but that's the hardest part. If you get that, it's not too bad after that. All right, so it's involved. I do get a lot of partial credits. So the, the key is remember as many steps as you can. If you can't remember a step, just plug a number down and say, I can't remember this step, and I'm going to use 5.3 or something, just so you know. All right. So everybody get those numbers down so you can see. So this 121, that's what we think claims. LAE and expenses are going to be next year. The present value of that is that divided by 1.045 raised to the 0. 0.5. That's 118.73. That's step two. So you take next year's expenses, LAE, and claims and you divide it by one plus the investment rate raised to the 0. 0.5. Because we gave you that 0. 0.5 That's the timing. That's step two. Step three is underwriting gain. You'll have this is one place you'll have two numbers. So if the premium is 120.2, you subtract a 121.37 and you get negative 117. On the other premium, you get negative 505. All right. And then step four is with capital numbers. The beginning capital is just the 120 divided by three, and then the 120.2 divided by three, so there's not much difference in those two, and then the average, so you need those three numbers, the beginning number, the, um, the ending number, and then the average, and then the change, so you really need four numbers. So that's all, that's all step uh, three. Step four, the investment income, you're taking the difference between, and I just wrote the number down. So you've got the undiscounted 121.37 minus the discounted 118.673. That gives you a difference of 264. So you take the 264 plus four and a half percent that you earn on beginning surplus, and it gives you 444. And again, that's the same. You notice how most of them are the same between the dividend, I mean, between the different premiums. So you don't have that many different calculations. And then the next step is you take your underwriting gain plus that investment income minus that change. And our, you can do the net income if you want to first, minus the change. So I, I did the net income and the adjusted all together in one number. So. You had an underwriting loss of 117, investment income of 444, and your net worth, your required capital went up 0.07. So that gives me uh, 3.2, and I divide up by the average required capital, 40.04, and gives me the 8% return. And then I got 14% return on the other one, which doesn't make sense because it's a lower premium. So I'll probably have net error in here somewhere. Not sure where. Y'all didn't even try the other premium, did you? No, I did not So I don't, I don't know what I did on that one. It doesn't make sense that it would be a higher ROE, even with the lower, because the capital is not that much lower. So I obviously have an error. Oh, because I didn't type in the the number. <laughs> yeah, it's only one point five seven percent. So yeah. All right. When's the next time you're going to do this? <clears throat> on the exams, so you'll have to get some practice, but you got problems online with this class and with the last class that you can practice. It's pretty involved, but you only have two math problems on this exam and the other math problems pretty straightforward, so it's not, not bad at all. Wait, I have a question. Uh -huh. How did you get the 3.2? So the 3.2 is my unwriting loss plus my investment income. Mm -hmm. Minus the change in required capital. So it's underwriting loss of 117, under, uh, investment income 444, and change in capital 07. Okay. Thank you. you notice on the other premium, your change in capital is actually an increase because 
or Kari Kapil came down. So you actually had that back. Not enough to offset a much slower underwriting loss. All right. Let me save this so I don't lose it. But All right. Good. Okay, so we're going to do a little practice with Schedule P as well. Let's probably leave that there. All right, so Schedule P. Oh, this is the other math problem. This is one almost everybody gets 100% on because it's pretty straightforward. All right, so I still don't understand the prior. The reason I don't is, you know, next year 2000 is going to drop off. So you think 2000 would drop into that prior, but obviously it, the, priors, if the prior is like every single year they've been in existence. I'm not sure what the prior means. So some actuary, one of y'all is going to come back one of these years and explain what the prior means. So I don't understand, but we can ignore that. The rest of it, I do understand. And so over here, we have accident year. And up here, we have accounting year. And reason I say accident year, it's the same as the year it's written, but you know, you have to have the accident in the year that you have the policy. And so that's the year the accident happened, but we don't know how much those losses are gonna be until well into the future. So this is incurred. This is the total we expect. Each one of these is a new forecast. And as this changes, it impacts net income for that calendar year. And it can be really quite significant in some years, especially when you have a year like Katrina or I mean, these, this is a pretty old one. This is an old exam question. Um, you know, you can have, I mean, you look here, you got 300 million bucks. Your net income's higher by 300 million bucks, but it has nothing to do with that year's business. It was a prior year adjustment. So it can be pretty massive. I can't remember what their net income is, but I know these adjustments can be 60, 70, 80% of net income. Um, they can, they're pretty sub sub substantial. Um, and especially think, you know, a stock investor, they're saying, hey, how fast are they growing their earnings? Well, if you don't take this adjustment out, you might think, wow, they're really growing their earnings fast or they're really doing well. But no, that was last year. They just they just adjusted it. And then the cumulative paid, the difference in those two is going to tell you the, um, the reserve. So let's work one of these problems so you can see it. We haven't worked one yet, but let me show you the questions that I give you. The one year and two year loss development. Easy, easy, easy question. Because all you got to do is take the column I give you and subtract the previous column from the one year, subtract two columns back from the two years. About as easy as you can get. So we're talking here. The only thing you have to watch out for is which year. So we're talking the 2008 year and the 2004 accident year. So what's a lot of students like to do is bring a highlighter and um, I'll even make extra copies of the exam so you can keep highlighting over and over again. But we're talking the 2008 column for the 2004 accident year. So remember accident year goes across. So your one year loss of element is going to be this minus that. 63.50 minus 63.57. So 63.50 minus 63.57. And you leave leave the minus sign. So you, you do the current year minus the prior year. So the minus sign is important. Uh, the minus sign is a good thing because that means they reduce the reserves. It's helping net income. The two years, the same number, but then you just go back two years. So 63.57 minus, I mean, 63.53 minus 63.57. Oh, wait, sorry. I'm sorry. 
63.50 minus 63.82. And that gives you minus 32. These two numbers are actually shown in, in the annual financial statements, um, just the one and two year. I don't know why they picked one and two year, but just to show you the quality of the reserving. So this firm actually had to reduce the reserves for this business, which means that helped their net income, which means they, they must be conservative in those years. Any question on that one? That's kind of the easiest question on it. Huh? I'm sorry. How do we know or supposed to use the part two or part three? All right. So the only time you're going to use the part three is when the question about what reserve would you set up? The second question. Because the reserve is the difference between what you ultimately expect to pay out and what you already have paid out. Right. That's the only time we use that, that, that third schedule. Mm hmm. So what is A asking? Like, what do we, what are our answers? That's your answer, right there, right there. But you're going to show all your work, right? Just to make sure, because if you write these numbers and get the wrong number, you get 71.46, and I'll, I'll give you full credit because I can tell you just transpose the numbers. So write everything down. Everybody see where we got these numbers? So this is a thing. So one thing I do in this class, I want to make sure actuaries know some kind of basic things actuaries do. You will not see a one year and two year loss development on the life insurance company. That doesn't exist. They don't do that. Maybe health insurance, maybe, but life insurance, definitely not. Annuities, definitely not. So this is very much a property and casualty type of thing. Uh, Could you also, um, highlight in green, where should you do uh, the 6256 level, like down there? Yeah, so we I said 2008 year. And then the one year, you just go one year back, two years, you just go two back, years back. That number minus that one, leave the minus sign if it's there. That number minus that one. That is what the one, if you go under annual reports and see the one and two year, it's going to look ex exactly like this. Well, you won't be able to calculate an annual report because you'd have to take all these schedules and put them together to be able to figure it out. All right. So Selma, here's the only question, what reserve would you set up? So I get the advantage that I can do this, but, um, but I'll, you know, I'll bring extra, I'll try to remember bring extra pages of this. So if you want to have one for each question, that would be fine. So the reserve you'd set up for 2005 accident years. So is that this or this? Accident year was yeah. this one here. Yeah, this is the accident year. So 2005 accident year. All we got to know is which year are we setting the reserve up for? So for business for the 2007 balance sheet. So that's the accounting year. So 2007. So we think we're going to pay out 6174, 628. So far, we've only paid out 5537, 697. So six one seven four six two eight minus five five three seven six ninety seven. So you're gonna set up a reserve for that. Y'all, those numbers are the same, right? That I gave you. Hopefully, six twenty eight six ninety seven. Uh -huh. How do we know which chart to use? That's what someone was asking. The only time you use chart three is on that question. This is chart three is how much you you paid. Chart two is how much you expect to pay in total. So how much do you have to set up your liability? It's what you expect to pay, you haven't paid yet. So you take the total minus what you paid the date. So the only time you need schedule three, part three, is when you're doing this question B, setting up your reserve, all right? Other questions on that? All right, here's a tricky question, but um, sometimes you have to kind of Think through it a little carefully, but all right, so we don't need 
hard to free again, but let's get rid of these colors. Using the most recent information available. So 2009. How much was 2005 net income misstated and in which direction due to 2004 accident year? We, in 2009, we thought we were gonna pay out 6353995. Let's see how much was, you gotta be real careful here. How much was 2005? Five net income misstated. So you got to make sure 2005 net income is a calendar year thing. Looking at this number. And then the 2004 business, that's where you're going across. So in 2009, if as of right here, we had known this number, we would have set this number up, but at that time, this is what we thought. So they thought they were going to pay out six billion four sixty four. Now, with new information, they think it's six billion three fifty three. All right. So is that better or worse? Do they release reserves or do they increase reserves? They're going to release, right? It's lower, so that should help net income. So six three five three six four six four. Well, it's easy to remember. So your ultimate. We, I've been using that word ultimate a little bit. The ultimately expect to pay out six fifty three, but back then we thought it was six four six four. So we overstated. You may even write this on the exam just to make sure you're overstating not revenue. You're overstating expenses. You overstated expenses by one ten three ninety one. So you understated net income by one ten. 391. So you your net income should have been 110, 391 higher, but it was lower because you had the wrong reserve. All right. That one can be a little tricky. Um, but and, and you, you have to have two things in this answer. Your understated net income. Um, but the best way to say it is hey, we overstated our expenses in 2005 versus what we believe today. So we must have understated net income in 2005. There's one more question to this, but it's real simple, and I'll show y'all. We'll, we'll get to we'll, we'll do a practice problem. A real simple question. Questions on that? Let's, let's try another one just for some practice. Never understand Bill Gates on the uh, the tabbing. It just doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, all right. So we got part two and part three. Yeah, these are really old. I've been using these for years. So I'm actually, I actually give you the current numbers for our firm, which if you think about it, it takes me forever to build because I have to type off. You can see why I get lazy. I have to type all of these numbers. I haven't figured out a way to copy and paste it into Excel because it's not in a format. So, but I do like using current numbers. All right. So same question, the one and two year loss development ratios for calendar year 2007. So once you see calendar year, highlight that column. For 2004 accident year, as soon as you see the accident year, highlight that row. So we're looking at this number versus these two numbers. So the one year is going to be 68667.98 minus 6911785. If you get a negative number, show it as a negative number. So 44987. And then the two year loss development 
It's the same number, 6866798 minus 6917430. Right. Questions on that one? That one tends to be like the easiest of all, other than the fourth question I said, which is even easier, but really, really easy question. All right, the reserve, how many schedules do you need on this one? Two, two schedules. So, this out. Reserve you would set up for 2004 accident year business. So, let's set up 2004 on both schedules. on the 2008 balance sheet. So we ultimately expect in 2008, we ultimately expected 6861964, but we'd only paid 6671265. So six eight six one nine sixty four minus that. Can I do that in my head? Probably not. I don't think I can. I'm not an expert, so. Um. <laughs> Something like that. What's the answer? Oh, 190,699. 699. How'd I go backwards? 699. Does that sound right? Oh, yeah. I was I was typing backwards. I had the right numbers. I just typed it back. Does that sound right? So that's a very, very simple. So on their balance sheet, they're going to have a liability for that business. They're obviously going to do all the business. So it's going to be a much bigger number. They'll do that for every single one of these, but for that one year, that's how much they're setting up, 190 million. Questions on that one? All right, and then the, the tougher question, but we'll see. Using the most recent information, so that's 2010, we're gonna use 2010 data because that's what we, that was the most recent when I did this exam. How much was 2007 net income? So we're doing 2000 net income. Misstating which direction for 2003. Excellent years. So you need two numbers here. You need what they ultimately thought versus what do they think today. So, thought cost would be that. Now, this, which is lower, right? So, they overstated claims in 2007 by. Six nine fifty two seventy four minus. I'm sorry. Well, six nine three nine six ninety six. Whatever that number is.
ten five seventy eight. So since the la the year of two thousand seven, they were ten thousand five seven eighty two high. So they understated down by five seventy eight. And you could see, I mean, it's cumbersome the way we're doing it, but you could see if you could get this electronically, you could really go back and adjust their net incomes, get a much more better understanding of the true volatility of their earnings and the growth in their earnings by making these these uh, these adjustments. I think there's there's another. We didn't do that one, did we? So you got another practice problem there, another practice problem there. Another one there. We won't do this one. We'll probably do one in class. So I'll, I'll give you one from the last exam. Another problem. There are several of them out there. See, I'm getting a little more current. That one has the answer in it, which is nice. Yeah. But you have more. You have more to practice with. So we'll probably want to practice all of those before. A week before the exam, just get some some more exposure. All right, any questions on that? I love Schedule P; it's really powerful. Um, so that that is it for pricing. Um, Camille was mentioning she listened to the podcast. I think it's a little technical, but she thought she was getting. She said she was getting a lot out of it. They do talk about quite. That's just such a long podcast. I listened to another one today on DNO, and it was only thirty minutes long, and it was pretty interesting as well. Um, the question they asked on that one I thought was interesting because I've wondered about this with liability. Is if we didn't have DNO, would that shut down lawsuits? Because. If there's no insurance, you're not going to sue, you know, because DNO, you're suing actual people. You want to get their house and their cars, but you sue them because they had DNO. So he was asking, hey, if there was no DNO, no one would sue because you don't want to sue these people. Um, and they had an interesting discussion on that um, and talked some interesting cases. So um, they talked Silicon Valley Bank that there's obviously going to be some lawsuits on that because this podcast was done. Like, he hasn't done a podcast in a few months. So this one's a little old. So, but he was saying it was really, you know, I, I've kind of always known this, but anytime a stock price falls a bunch, lawyers just start suing. They don't look, you know, you're supposed to say the management was negligent, but lawyers don't care. They just start suing. And then during discovery, they're going to find something and see what happens. And, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. So, um, yeah, and then my my risk management class, we talked about black swans. So he asked them the question, how did you get into that business? Remember, I talked about black swans. It's going to define most of your life. He says, oh, I was playing rugby, and there's uh, there's one of these DNO guys on the team. So I became, that's what I became. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, play rugby, and that changes the next 50 years of your life. So it's interesting. So they're good. That one's, an, that one's an interesting one. It's only 30 minutes long. Um. There's several others that are very interesting. So it's a great, great podcast. I don't know why he hasn't done one in a while. Um, maybe he just needs new people to talk to. All right. One quick topic. We've covered all these policies. Um, I don't know where else to throw this in other than right here. So I just want to help just understand this business. We've kind of talked a little bit about this when we were talking about when do corporations or should corporations buy insurance? And when you look at this list, you know, you'll notice that insurance companies do much different type of insurance for corporations than they do for individuals. And it all has to do with transfer versus retention. There's some insurance products, the ones we buy that are mostly transferred. We're transferring the risk to State Farm or to Allstate. And there's some products, there's almost no transfer. The firm is retaining almost all the risk, but for some reason are using a, a, um, an insurance product to do something, usually related to taxes. We'll talk about that. Um, so mostly transfer is what you buy, which is guaranteed cost insurance. 
That's the insurer agrees to reimburse losses in exchange for a premium. The premium's fixed probably for a year. And when the year is up, so th this is this is actually pretty, pretty critical. When the year is up, if your premium increases, it's based on the class, not on you. It's really, really critical. Actuaries understand this, no one else does. And so actuaries have these people screaming at them. I went to one USAA member meeting and people were telling me, and they said, watch, they're gonna ask this one question. So what, what question, watch that guy over there, you can tell he's gonna ask this question. You can kind of tell us some old crusty guy. And his question was, my son had a claim last year and you shot up his premium just to get your money back. That's what he was saying. This is an insurance. He had a claim and you didn't like paying him $5,000 claim. So you're going to shoot up his premium so you can get your money back. And what, are the, what do actuaries say? No, that's not true. We're not doing that. So what would an actuary say? Why did they increase his premium? Because he threw himself at the risk. Right. He changed classes. He went from a person who doesn't have accidents to a person who has accidents. And I remember they're explaining that, and the guy was like, not bullied. He wasn't taken. You could see his body language. This only he probably drove five hours to ask this one question. And he was like, really fit to be tight. He was really upset. And this, I don't know who answered the question, probably the president of the PNC company. And he was very calm and kind of answered, but he could tell the guy was mad. And usually people who come to a membership meeting like that, they're usually mad about something. They're like, wow, I really love this company. Let me go tell them about it. They're usually upset about something. So uh, so that's guaranteed costs. If you have a claim, they're not going to increase your premium because you had a claim. They're going to increase your premium because you changed the class of driver that you are. Uh, same thing if you speed. If you speed, some of your premium goes up. Why? Because you went from being a non-speeder to being a speeder. Um, so, yeah. Which is kind of nice, right? Because, um, you know, as long as you, you keep driving the same, don't change, you know, you, you have some confidence there. Now, let's say you don't change classes and your premiums go up. Why is that? That's because of inflation, whatever. You know, they're filing. The whole class is going up because of inflation or whatever, whatever is happening uh, differently there. So the question is, will, who's doing the telematics? <laughs> Which team is that? That's y'all. Will telematics change this? Will we become with telematics changes from guaranteed cost insurance to more experience rated where they start looking at your specific, is it experience rated or is there many more classes? And I don't know what y'all are finding on telematics. Are we gonna go from 50 classes to 5 million classes where AI is gonna take every single piece of data. It's like, wow, you really turn sharply on your turns. Wow, you drive 55 and a 50, whatever. And they get all this data. Uh, you drive between, you drive a lot between 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. versus 5, you know, whatever they have. Could, could telematics just create many more classes or whatever? So uh, one thing we said for sure, and y'all, Lauren, your team's probably seen this, is how many miles you drive. And Mufaral Mufar, Mufar, Mufar mentioned that. Um, and I didn't realize, I thought USA's telematics was actually counting the number of miles it drove. So that's why I kept kicking my my bike miles off of it, um, but it doesn't seem, but that would make sense that they would count how many miles you do. So telematics could radically change this. We could have much more specialized insurance. Then you have experience rated plans. What this means is it's still guaranteed cost, but a portion of the premium is gonna be based entirely on your experience. And that's called credibility. So credibility is how much confidence do we have basing the premium in your experience? The more credibility, the more of your premium is based on your experience. Um, telematics might fit into this, but um, the advantage of experience rated plans is you have some control. You have an incentive to do better because that's going to um, possibly in, in improve your premium. Um, 
And what team is doing the uh, changes and cars and that's y'all? You might listen at DNO. It was really interesting because they mentioned on cybersecurity that cyber insurance is actually dictating what firms have to do. They have to do certain things uh, before they can get the insurance. You're seeing that um, with property insurance, especially with corporations, you have to have a fire alarm, you have to have a sprinkler system. And so he asked a really interesting question, is insurance doing that with DNO as well? Before you get DNO, you have these things. And he says, no, we, there's just too many things that can go wrong. Doesn't make sense. Uh, what about medical insurance? So it's an interesting conversation. So, um, you know, no. how much of a break in your premium you get do you have do you get because you have anti-lock brakes or because you have an airbag, you know, those kind of things. So is the insurance actually influencing um people's behavior? So he said on cybersecurity, absolutely insurance is having a big impact there. Interesting, it was only 30 minute conversation, he had really, really good conversation. Uh, but that's what credibility is saying is, hey, you do something that improves your frequency and severity. We're going to give you some break on that. And that could go the other way, right? You do something that makes it worse and we could charge you more. Uh, so higher credibility means it's more weighted to your actual experience. Um, OK, this I already talked about up above. So. All right. Retrospectively rated plans. You might say this isn't like insurance at all. So the premiums base, not on your prior experience, but it's based on your class. But your final premium is not known until the end of the year. And then they go back and look and see how many losses you have, and they adjust your premium based on that. And you might say, well, that doesn't make sense. They charge me 5000 and then they say, wow, you have $15,000 in claims. We're going to charge you $20,000 now. So that doesn't, that doesn't sound like insurance, does it? <laughs> your insurance company say, hey, we're charging you $500, but if you have an accident, we're going to charge you whatever we paid you. That, that doesn't sound like insurance. So how does this become insurance? There is a range that the premium must be within. So if you have really good experience, they'll reduce your premium. If you have really bad experience, they increase it. But within that range, that's all they can do. After you hit the range, you can't. So it's it's much more of your experience than just what credibility would be. Um, so outside of this range, you're transferring risk. Within the range, you're not transferring risk. You're kind of self-insuring. Um, so paid loss retro insurance reimburses the insurer when losses are actually paid, not when they're incurred. Um, I don't know if Kirby's going to get into some of these um, the DNO, he talked about claims made versus man, you know, what we talked about a little bit. It gets really, really complicated. Um, so there's some questions I got to remember to ask Kirby. Um, not for y'all's interest, but there are questions I never knew the answer to. So now that he's here, I'm going to ask it as if I'm asking it for your benefit and he won't know that I don't know the answer to that. Um, but there's some very, very specific terminology that the CAT people use that no one else uses. Some of you, the, those of you doing the cat bond paper, you're probably, have you seen that um, reattachment? Have you seen that term reattachment? That's an interesting term. So maybe Kirby will get into that. I hope he does. It's 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 a quite jargon heavy, heavy field. Then there's some, you know, to me, a minus ASO and retroactively, they sound the same. It's just ASO tends to be much more retention than transfer. So what ASO is, they're essentially, you're hiring them, you're outsourcing to them. Workers' comp, a good example. They're going to take care of the people that are injured. They're going to take care of the paperwork. And they're going to have more bargaining power, whether it's with rehab centers or whatever. So it eliminates your internal staff. So where's the insurance here? Well, here they have a stop loss. They say, okay, you're paying all the claims. We're just taking care of the records. However, if your claims hit X dollars, we'll pay over that. And so that's the stop loss. So it's it's similar to the retro plans, but it's just that the maximum tends to be much, much higher. So you are retaining a whole lot more of it. Um, so workers' comp is probably the best example of that. And then mainly retention, we get these bizarre things. And when you see bizarre things, bizarre equals IRS almost always. It's always tax driven here. So captive insurance companies, what's a captive insurance company? 
USA had one of these. It's a company owns an insurance company that only has one customer and that's that company. <laughs> so you could try this, right? You start your own insurance company, only insures your auto insurance. How much risk transfer have you done? Not a whole lot, right? The only way you have risk transfer is if you could have that company go insolvent and kick it off. And then, you know, that might, might help you. Then you don't have to pay your bills or whatever. But captive, the insurance company is operated and owned by one insured. Uh, you avoid the morale hazard priced into. You remember when you buy insurance, it makes you riskier. When you do captive, you don't have that. Um, <clears throat> state law requires use of insurance. So sometimes firms, you know, if you have in your state that requires you to use insurance, and you know, it's bizarre to say, hey, you have to buy insurance. Say, well, can I buy insurance from my own company? Yeah, you can do that. It's like they're just shifting paper around. Um, one of the biggest negatives is you do have to pay state premium taxes. And that can be 2% of premiums. It can be pretty significant. So what do you do? You go to Bahamas. You go to Cayman, Cayman Islands. Um, you know where all those places are, right? I mean, these are the big places. They don't charge insurance. They don't charge premium taxes. So there's a lot of captive insurers on these sites. When USA had it, I remember Paula used to have to do this and I think I told you, I mean, she had to fly to Bahamas, meet in the airport and fly back because you couldn't be on U.S. soil. I always like to tease her because I like to ask her about the captive. And it was like uh, she couldn't talk about it when she was in the U.S. And so, it's like, yeah, I can't hear you. I don't know anything about that. Um, they're required to participate in assigned risk pools. So that can be negative as well. Um, but they get they get good federal tax treatment. It's essentially a way of getting deductions earlier. When you do a captive, you can kind of move those deductions up earlier. Uh, the federal government after 9-11 actually set up, and this is the reason USA had a captive, it sets up a captive for terrorism risk. And the way it works is you set up your own captive and then the government says at some point, we'll actually step in and help. So you're getting some taxpayer dollars. I don't remember exactly how it worked. Uh, none of you are doing terrorism risk. If you did terrorism risk, you'd actually go back and look at that law that was established in uh, 2002. Um, I think it's still in place, but you could you could see what it is. But a lot of it's handled through captives. And this last one is not insurance at all. Essentially, what it says is, if you have a major claim, we're going to be there to loan you money to pay it, but you still have to pay us back. <laughs> so that's just borrowing money. But ultimately, everything is transfer once you go bankrupt. Okay, so ultimately, if you can't pay your bills, you go under, then someone else, your bondholders, your stockholders, someone's going to pick that up until you go out. So you don't care about most of these except for the guaranteed cost insurance. But corporations, they're playing with all of these, looking at the benefit costs, the risk transfer. So when we talked about suit corporations buy insurance, a lot of it is this stuff where they're really not buying insurance. They're just doing things that are just schemes to make it work for taxes and outsourcing. So, all right. So next time we'll probably, um, we'll probably work the uh, schedule P problems next time, right? To get some practice on that. I won't do all the steps because there really aren't any steps on that. And then this sounds boring, but the accounting, there's, especially if you're going to interview with an insurance company, you need to know some certain things. And I'll try to just stick with the really big stuff. All right, we'll stop it there.